In today's show, we will talk about GDPR. Topics for today's discussion are going to be what is GDPR, consequences of non-compliance, parties involved, data types, rights of the data subject, breach notification, how am I impacted, how to be ready. Now the big question, what is GDPR? GDPR stands for General Data Protection Regulation. It has evolved from the Data Protection Directive, which came out in 1995, and there has been no changes to it ever since then. Uh, GDPR itself was adopted in April of 2016 uh, with a two-year grace period, which means that by May 2018, compliance has to be in place. GDPR is in place to address modern use of data because uh, when Data Protection Directive was introduced in 1995, data use was not as it is right now. Uh, There's not a lot of data being collected. Um, And now the data collection and data awareness has become more prevalent. So um, this new protection regulation has been put in place to address that. And of all, um, the most important piece is to respect the individual's right to their personal data. So when you give your data to an organization, the data is still yours and um, the organization has to ensure that the data is only used for the reason it was collected for and they will not use it for anything else. you should be able to request that your data gets removed from their systems if you don't want it there. And if it is inaccurate, you should be able to um, update it. Uh, These are basic data requirements which are also included in uh, PIPEDA. So before we delve into the rest of the GDPR um, requirements and um, prerequisites, I thought I'd show this. Um, the cost of non-compliance. Uh, hopefully this will perk up your, your interest and uh, um, get you going on this thing if you have not yet started on this journey. If you have, excellent, good job. Um, so it is uh, split into two um, categories. One is a major infraction, which is going to be fined at 20 million euros or 4% of the annual global revenue, whichever is higher. So notice the fact that it talks about annual global revenue. So if you are an international organization, your revenue across the globe, 4% of that, that's what they're going after. So, uh, and the next one is the minor infraction where uh, the fine is a bit lower, but um, nevertheless, it's still pretty high. Uh, so it's 10 million euros or 2% of annual global revenue, whichever is higher again. So they have pretty much split these into two tiers. Um, if you wanted more information, you can go to the GDPR Article 83. It explains the details as to what's included, uh, what's considered a major uh, versus what's considered a minor. So to understand GDPR, um, And now that you understand the gravity of the situation, uh, the cost of non-compliance, it is key to understand these terms. um, The parties involved in a typical GDPR um, uh, compliance requirement. So the the requirement identifies certain people. Um, The data controller is the entity collecting the data which is the organization uh, which is going to be providing you the service. So they are the data controller. They might also be the data processor, uh, but they might um, uh, give this job of processing the data to a third party. Um, So that's why it was decided to distinguish between the two. So data processor is somebody who is processing the data on behalf of the data controller. Data subject, the most important piece in here, um, is the entity whose data has been collected by the data controller. So in order for the data controller to provide the service, 
um, the data subject says here is some of my data and provide me the service um, and what's important is uh, for the data controller is um, to only collect information that is required to provide the service that is being offered don't collect any more data than you have to because the more data you collect the bigger the issue becomes of protecting it and safeguarding it and gdpr is all about that right uh, making sure you collect what what you um, um, what you need and likewise for the data subject the data subject has every right to question the data controller uh, in terms of what data they're collecting about them they um, so they're it's well within the rights to question them um, the last item is a data protection officer so um, the rule is if if an organization has um, more than 250 employees then they should have a data protection officer which is a a generic rule um, it it sometimes it, it does not hold true because you could be a small organization of 10 people uh, you have a very uh, busy website you are providing a certain service and hundreds of thousands of users are are using that service so uh, in that case you have to make sure um, you have a data protection officer who can whose sole responsibility is going to be how do they protect data, how the data has been collected, um, where where is the data stored, uh, to make sure they they know where data is at all, all times. So the data that gets collected from the data subject by the data controller um, as per GDPR, it falls into two categories the personal data uh, which is uh, the ability to identify an individual uh, such as IP address email address your mailing address etc um, so if you have an, an IP address and you can um, you link a name to it then it becomes personal data because now you know Joe is using this IP address so every time this IP address comes in you know Joe owns it let's say Joe owns that IP address forever it's not a DHCP address the next set of categories um, are special categories of personal data such as date of birth religion gender personal lifestyle affiliations genetic information race ethnicity health data etc so these are considered special categories of data and the key is if you collect any of this data then you have to protect it and you are in the crosshairs of GDPR so now you as a data subject are providing this data to the data collector you have certain rights so the data collector cannot collect data about you without your consent and the consent is not just a, a disclaimer on a on a web on a 50 page um, disclaimer note and, and, and it's hidden somewhere there has to be on top of that particular page which, uh, which you see when you sign up for a new service there has to be a, a separate section that talks about consent or collecting data and it has to be a box so you cannot uh, assume that if someone has has read 20 pages of disclaimers and they've said yes they have actually consented to providing you their data so what GDPR also says is the consent has to be explicit somebody has to go and do something somewhere to acknowledge the fact that they have they're consenting to sharing certain piece of data with you and once this once they select that check mark 
that information should be tracked and stored. So you as a data collector have to make sure that when that check mark was selected, you record the time and the date and that information does not get deleted from your records. So because transparency is one of those other things in GDPR where you have to make sure that uh, you are able to prove that you do have the consent from this individual for collecting their data. Sorry, so not the individual, the data subject. It is the individual, but, uh, but we won't talk in terms of GDPR over here. And the consent is, is not limited to recording the piece about when they provide the consent. You should also be recording as a data collector when they revoke the consent. So you should be recording um, when they consented and when they denied the consent and uh, sorry, when they revoked the, the consent and if they did it, this in a matter of three or four days, so you should have all the logs available, okay? Because if there's any, any issues, then you're able to prove that between this period, you had no data uh, for that individual. The next piece is access. Um, so the data subject has full rights to access their data. So if they want to see what data you have about them, you should be able to provide all their data to them. What that means is, so you as a data collector have to make sure that you know any data that you collect, you know why it is being collected and where is it being stored to address such a situation where if somebody comes to you looking for the data, you should be able to go through all your systems pretty quickly and get back to them saying that, Mr. Customer, Mr. Data Subject, this is the data we have about you. And likewise, the data subject can also come to you and say, I don't want any of your services. I would like all my data to be deleted from your systems. So you as a data controller have to make sure that any data that you have about the data subject, you know where it is. And this, this does not um, exclude um, backups. So anywhere you have data, so let's say you, you do a, a backup of the data, right? And this data, I, I know that um, tapes are becoming extinct. Um, let's say you have the data in a tape or in a data domain um, in, in a virtual tape library. So you have this data backed up somewhere and it is stored off-site. So you should know where this backed up data is or if you're backing it up into a cloud for resiliency purposes. So you should know where that is too. So when this data subject requests, requests deletion of the data, then you have to make sure that you know where the data is and you are able to delete the data within um, uh, within a short time frame. It has to be pretty quick. So the key for the data controller is to know at all times which systems are storing the data and how to get to it. And there, sh there should be processes identified within the, within the data controllers organization, how this is going to happen. So it should, it should not be a matter of, oh, somebody's asking us to delete the data. What do we do? So there should not be such oh shit moments. It should all be thought about, organized, documented, and roles and responsibilities identified as to who's doing what, how does this request comes come in, who processes it, how does this issue get resolved, how do you clo close it off. So you got to consider those things. And same thing with data motive modification as well. So, you know, if I, if I as a data subject 
find out that my data is inaccurate um, within your database somewhere uh, because that could be used incorrectly. So you as a data subject have every right to go to the data controller and ask them to first access the data to see what's there and then revert back to them with, with proper proofs that this is why you need the data modified um, because nobody's going to modify data without any any proof as such. And the last but not least is the data portability. So, and this goes in hand in hand with deletion, right? Is when a data subject wants to move the services from you as a, as a data controller, you are obliged to provide the data subject, their data in a format that is readable. So when you say as a data controller that you have provided the data to the data subject and if it's all, all gobbledygook, uh, it makes no sense. So you have to make sure it is a standard format. Um, CSV is a generally accepted format for data. So you provide the CSV and also um, the, the field um, names and all that information should be there as well. So it is not the data, but all the data descriptors should also be within that um, archive or file. Um, so what that means is uh, because this um, data subject is moving the services from you, they are in effect requesting um, uh, three things, right? They're saying they're going to um, remove their consent. Then they'll say, I want access to the data because I'm moving it. You will delete it. And portability is like, you know, you're giving it to me and thank you very much. And your business is going to conclude it. And there are some exceptions where the data controller might need to store certain pieces of data for their compliance and, and other regulations purposes. And this is purely legit. Um, uh, and this should be identified to the data subject uh, by the data controller that this these pieces of data cannot be deleted because of such reasons. So the next piece that is really important is the breach notification. As soon as a breach is, has been identified by the data processor, they have to immediately notify the data controller. So there's no grace period for this. The moment the data processor finds out, they will notify the data controller immediately. And the next one is the data controller itself. As soon as they find out there has been a breach, breach as in the data subjects data has been compromised and um, someone has access to the data and you know that something has happened uh, and you're trying to, trying to investigate. Don't wait till the investigation has finished. The moment you, you know for sure that the data has been compromised, you will notify the authorities um, and the data subjects of the breach within 72 hours. So this is not 72 working hours. This is 72 hours from the time of notification that you received that the data has been compromised. In certain cases, the data controller and data processor are going to be the same body. Um, so you would know right away and within 72 hours, you have to make sure the authorities and the data subjects are notified. Failure to do so will result in one of the fines that we spoke about. And I think when I read it, I think it's the minor infraction. So um, 10 million euros or 2% of your uh, global revenues. So, and, and the other key is for breach notification, um, you need to make sure and you have to make sure that the breach notification process is documented. Everybody who's involved knows what they have to do. So roles and responsibilities have to be um, assigned and agreed to by the parties. And at all times, you should know if a breach happens, 
what will happen. So if you are a data controller and you have given the processing to a third party, that third part, you you as a as the um, uh, organization which has outsources this uh, activity has to make sure that your um, um, third parties are complying to this requirement. So it is it falls on to you to make sure that they have all the necessary processes um, and they know that when a breach happens, what they're going to do and who they're going to inform. And you as a data controller has to make sure that you know who will inform and what the call tree or the process is going to be within your organization as to how do you get this whole thing going, right? So you're going to call a uh, emergency operations team of some sort. You're going to have a, a conference call and you're going to discuss it through and you're going to have notifications coming in. So so that, that whole process have to be very well documented. If you as a data controller or, or a data processor are fumbling at the point where you have you have noticed a, a breach and you just don't know what to do, it's too late to do anything. You you are pretty much messed up now. You know you're looking at at least ten million dollar, ten million euros of fines, um, and the fine would be um, on the data controller, uh, not the processor, because um, data controller is the is the body who who should make sure that the data processor has all all the necessary. Um, processes in place and you as a data controller also has to make sure that um, you have the necessary insurance also in place because um, cyber insurance is becoming pretty uh, prevalent these days so uh, one of the um, mechanisms of of um, address managing risk is also to ensure um, get cyber insurance so make sure that you look into that piece as well um, how, how to um, get insurance going, how do you notify them, how do you engage them, um, and what happens after that. We've spoken about what GDPR is, um, you know, what are the uh, key elements of it. The next piece is, how are you getting impacted? And not you as a data subject, but as a organization, as a data controller. So, So the key is that if you are a business operating anywhere in the world and you are collecting any of the um, two classes of the data uh, that are specified in in earlier um, uh, slides, then you are within the crosshairs of GDPR. Um, And the key is the data is about EU citizens residing in EU. So if an EU citizen is not residing in EU and they're residing elsewhere, that data is not coming under underneath this umbrella. So the key is it has to be about EU citizens residing in EU. So, so that, that should be the basis of, of your um, um, your assessment. And and as and i'm uh, i've not read this anywhere but i would think um is that um it implies when this individual when they provided you the data they were residing in eu okay so it's the time of the registration um that that would be key in my eyes that when they registered for your service they were residing in the EU and they were a EU, EU citizen at that point of time. And that's why you should be protecting the data. Um, and when I say protecting the data, um, it, it I'm assuming that you have all the controls in place uh, in your in your IT systems, such as you have a strong access control mechanisms, um, um, such as the, the databases have um, unique user IDs, no IDs are being shared, you have strong password controls in place, you are logging all the information um, as to who is accessing the data, uh, the application accounts are, are protected, um, uh, the passwords are changed regularly, um, and, and one of the best things would be if you could encrypt all the data that is in the database, 
that would be key. Um, and also, um, the data has to be protected when it's in transit. So you make sure that you are protecting it when the data is moving on the wires as well. Um, who can be the data, data subjects? So the data subjects can be your employees. So you, if you are in or, an organization um, outside EU and you have an employee in EU, then you are um, collecting information about an EU citizen residing in EU. Hence, you are, you know, um, required to comply with GDPR. Likewise, customers, um, if you are collecting information about data subjects that are residing in EU and are EU citizens, you are required uh, to comply with GDPR requirements. So one of the questions um, that I've received um, is that, but you know, we all in Canada, we already have PIPEDA. So why should we care? Um, well, PIPEDA is good, um, but it is not as prescriptive as GDPR. So um, just like the Castle Law in Canada says, if you're collecting information about Canadian citizens, you will have to abide by the Castle regulation. Same thing happens over here. Um, if you, you have Papida compliance in place, good, good enough, good for you. That only works in Canada, but does not work in uh, in Europe. So you have to comply with their requirements, whatever they may call it. It might be similar, but um, the good thing is if you have Papida in place, you are pretty close in terms of complying with GDPR. So you can use that same collateral um, augmented with with the additional requirements of GDPR and um, and then you're you're good to go right so if you're an organization operating in Canada um, you have all the proper pipeta controls in place you are you're nearly there you know I would say uh, you are um, about 80 percent there um, you might have to put in some of the processes in place but you, you you're pretty close so it's, it should for you um, as a Canadian organization, it should be a matter of um, doing a gap analysis uh, with PIPEDA and the GDPR requirements and um, and seeing where the, where the gaps are. And once you know that, it's it should be pretty easy peasy. Um, United States, it's a bit more complicated because um, there are different state regulations that, that you have to comply by. Um, so, uh, and I, I'm not really sure what the state regulations are because they change they're different from state to state but if if you think of it um, if you are trying to protect people's data um, then you are going to be pretty close in terms of the requirements again i don't know i can't say it um, how close would you be to the gdpr um, requirements uh, but you know you would make make mix make a dent there and you wouldn't be starting from from zero hopefully so how do you plan for for this uh, GDPR um, like I said earlier it is key that you have to know where the data is that you're collecting about data subjects how you are protecting it where it is stored so the key is a, um, a a solid configuration management database CMDB, where you are storing all information about all assets in a in a central location, um, and which is not an activity that happens once in a blue moon. You are doing it regularly. Um, everyone knows about it. Everybody knows the importance of of doing it and making sure the data is accurate. So collecting data is one thing, making sure it's accurate is the other. So you have to make sure that it's always accurate and it's always current and you know where it is, right? Um, and also um, one of the things the data privacy officer has to also make sure is that when the data is being collected by a certain project within the organization, yeah, they have to make sure that as a privacy impact assessment being done, um, has um, 
do you know what the data retention of the data is how long you're going to be retaining the data um, and w and the purpose of the data collection how sorry why are you collecting the data um, is there more data being collected than what is required by the service if it is the case then don't collect the data uh, do without it because the more you have the more you are risking your life so sorry more you're risking your business i'm sorry about that so uh, so the purpose of data collection has to be important and uh, having a data privacy officer always it, it's a small investment in in the bigger scheme of things so um, i would i would go for a data privacy officer any, any time because you have an individual who knows their role what is the what their role is and what they're supposed to do um, if you if they can focus on what they're doing they will be able to get more processes and procedures in place so the key is inventory of your systems know where the data is then the next piece is the implementation you will need to have the policies procedures and governance mechanisms to address you know um, how you through your uh, software or your application how are you collecting the consent how the modifications to consent are being um, being collected um, how long you're storing that consent information and the identifiers in that consent also should make sense so that they're tied to the customer it should not be a matter of going for for a phishing exercise once you uh, once you know oh we have the data now we have to find out who who this was for um, because some something's changed so you have to make sure where the consent is coming from who it is um, and like i said collect only information that um, that's required so you, your data requirement should be documented and signed off by somebody in the, in the privacy office to make sure that yes this is the data we need and this is why we were collecting it this is how long we're going to retain it um, uh, that should be and as i said earlier again uh, breach notification process has to be documented um, and everybody has to understand their roles um, so so the key is in, in any good operation that is secure and is providing the level of security and assurance that a customer needs and for an organization to operate effectively and securely they have to know what they're managing um, and once you know what you're managing you should have uh, proper processes documented processes um, and also um, uh, people understanding their roles and responsibilities and that's not enough you should have somebody governing over all this stuff making sure that yes you have the processes you have the procedures you have the documentation to support everything it is is it being exercised uh, is it being done properly um, so uh, it is not enough to have it documented you know you, you document something and you know, it goes on a shelf somewhere or it goes into some storage somewhere and that's pretty much it right so um, you, you should have a governance and a compliance program in place that makes sure that this this uh, the controls uh, are being tested regularly uh, they're not a once a year activity you your compliance team is doing an ongoing continuous compliance to make sure that um, the requirements are being met you don't want to be too late in the game to to realize the fact that oops you know you're not compliant anymore uh, because the moment you you let your guard down bad things can happen and uh, you know um, you don't want to get fined 10 million euros or, or the higher limit the 20 million euros or the worst case scenario four percent of your global annual global uh, revenue hey everybody i uh, hope you found uh, the information i shared with you uh, today uh, to be useful um, uh, please like subscribe and share uh, the content in your social circles um, if you want to contact me my contact details are on my website uh, sekinoid.com uh, the address is also at the bottom left hand corner of, uh, of this the slide deck lastly uh, thank you for your time and uh, talk to you soon bye bye